Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. This is a season of new temples. We've just seen one consecrated in Ayodhya, the Ram Temple, with profound political implications at home. We are now seeing, going to see yet another one inaugurated in Abu Dhabi in UAE. So the Prime Minister will be, head, will be headed there on 13th and 14th of February. That is, that, that is in less than two weeks from now. And almost as if on cue, and I think actually on cue, Union Cabinet, Indian Union Cabinet also approved the India-UAE Bilateral Investment Treaty. And this will be a historic event also because the inauguration of this temple, the first Hindu temple, the first temple, think of the implications, temple with idols in it, in a deeply Islamic country, in a deeply Islamic zone, that will have profound implications of for, for India's diplomacy, not just in the region, but in general to India's outreach or the state of India's relationship in the Islamic world. Now, having said that, I've used that expression Islamic world and I'm conscious of the fact that often enough I have in CTC, but even more than that in national interest disputed or argued against the idea of there being something like something called an Islamic world or being an Ummah because that's a theoretical construct. In real life, it doesn't work because different nations have their own national interests. They have their own regional interests. They have their regional groupings. They don't see themselves as becoming one nation united by a faith just because they come from one faith. In fact, within the faith also, there are many different lines of thought and it's not just Shias and Sunnis. There are many other variations as well. So that said, why is it that this temple opening is important? First of all, it is important, as I said just a couple of minutes back, it's, it's quite a gesture for a deeply Islamic country to allow a temple of the Hindu faith, of the Hindu faith in their country. They allocated the land, the temple has been built. It's been built by, by, a, by a very potent and very powerful and a very efficient Indian organization, spiritual temple building organization, also a sect called BAPS, B-A-P-S. It's a bit of a long name. I will try and pronounce it right. And if I don't get it right, my Gujarati friends, please forgive me. I will try and be better the next time. So, so this is Bocha Sanwasi, Akshar Purushottam Swami Narayan Sanstha. That is BAPS, Bucha Sanvasi, Akshar Purshottam, Swami Narayan, Sanstha. They are the ones who have also built the Akshadham temple in Delhi. So if they built a temple in Abu Dhabi, you can be sure it will be a top class temple. As good as any modern temples built anywhere. And they built in Gujarat, in Delhi, at least those temples a lot of us have seen by now. So this temple will be inaugurated. Mr. Modi will be there. What does it mean? I told you that it's a big gesture when a deeply Islamic country allows the building, not just allows, but encourages the building of a, of a temple, of a Hindu temple. This at a time where in Pakistan, which is an Islamic country, but with a Hindu minority and which, which is committed to looking after, at least constitutionally committed to looking after its minorities. That is where, while a lot of the Hindu temples do remain intact, but Every now and then, there are stories about temples being attacked or being converted into mosques. The subcontinent has a very mixed up history and a mixed up record on this. There are issues in India as well, in terms of what is old temple, what is old mosque. And we know, we see what's going on right now, say in Varanasi or what might happen in, in Mathura as well. Now, in that context, for UAE to build to allow the building of a Hindu temple, that tells you several things. One, it tells you very simply, very simply, the fact that UAE, Saudi Arabia, even Qatar, why just Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, UAE, but also Qatar, Kuwait, all of the all of the rich Middle Eastern countries, they cannot they cannot carry on with life as usual without 
millions and millions, lakhs and lakhs, adding up to a lot of people, a lot of Indian workers being there. They provide the bulwark of their services, not just their services, but an increasingly Indian talent is now staffing the entrepreneurial activity in the Middle East. Further, there is a lot of Indian investment there. Think of the number of, forget about investments in businesses, but just think of the number of apartments, houses, bungalows, villas being bought by rich Indians in the Middle East, particularly in UAE. So India is a very important factor and Indians are a very important factor in these countries. Second thing is just the rising importance of India in the world. Now India is now the fastest growing economy, but more than that, after India's relationship with America has changed dramatically over the past 10-12 years. With that, given the fact that Americans have always been the not just the net security providers, but in some ways the sole security providers to the Middle East. Given that situation and given the warming of the relationship between America and India, India has become also a natural partner for the Middle Eastern Arab countries, which in the past were suspicious of India and that compliment was fully returned. Why? Because in India, Saudi Arabia and by extension UAE, because Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, they are seen, they are seen to work together as the pro-American or, or America-friendly Arab Muslim countries. So these countries were seen to be hostile to India simply because they seem to be much more inclined towards Pakistan. This was the era when Saudi Arabia was exporting its own version of Wahhabi Islam across the world, not just in the Islamic world, but across the world. So a lot of the mosques that came up, say in Kashmir, for example, in other parts of India as well, they were funded by the Saudis and they brought in the Saudi version of the Wahhabi Islamic gospel which had a particular view of this teaching and practice of Islam. Now, Saudi Arabia has gotten off that curve. But before we come to that, the fact is that because of all these factors, there was suspicion in India, deep suspicion of the Gulf Arab countries. Also, a lot of India's crooks and terrorists, not, not to talk of Dawood Ibrahim and lots of his gangsters and shooters, they had made UAE their home. And that was also a reason for suspicion in India. So India by default leaned more towards these relatively secular states in the Arab world. That is Iraq and also Egypt. These two were seen as secular because both were run by either the Ba'ath Party in one case or, or legatees of the Ba'ath Party, dictators who were more militaristic, wore uniform and did not run their governments or their regimes in the name of Islam. India also managed a working relationship, a reasonably good working relationship with Iran. But with the Gulf Arabs, there was that hesitation. That hesitation is now broken. Now, if you want to know more about it, I will recommend some readings for you because I am also picking up my wisdom from some of those. So first of all, very good reading. Modi's New India Finds Old Role in Changing Middle East. This is, this is an article by C. Raja Mohan in Foreign Policy, dated 29th October 2021, then very significant. Ashley Tellis, Modi's three foreign policy wins. I found it on the Carnegie Endowment's website. It also says that it was originally published in the Economic Times on March 24, 2019. And he's the one who says that of the three foreign policy wins that Modi has had, he ranks his outreach to Saudi Arabia as being the most important. Then he says Japan. And then he talks about warming up of further warming up of India's relationship with America. But why does he put Saudi Arabia first? Because that is the region where India had not reached out as yet. Because India was shy, hesitant, also I would say resentful. India was resentful that you guys are playing games in our neighborhood. You are backing the Pakistanis. You are giving money to the Pakistanis because you are partners with them in Afghanistan. And because of your Wahhabi connection and you are also promoting a kind of Islam in our country that is not that is not helpful to cohesion in Indian society. Plus, whatever you might be doing in, say, Bangladesh and other countries in our, our neighborhood, they were also doing stuff in Malaysia, Indonesia, etc. But India was more concerned about what was happening in the neighborhood. So this outreach to Saudi Arabia, which 
for a BJP government was a big leap of faith and a very smart thing to do. In fact, I have had one key policy maker, top key policy maker in this government describe this to me as the Virinder Sehwag approach to diplomacy. So that is, that is what he lists first of the three biggest foreign policy achievements for Modi government. And this article, as I mentioned to you, was published on March 24, 2019. That is even before Narendra Modi won his second term. The next article is by Kabir Teneja in, in Foreign Policy Magazine, India's New Middle East Policy Take Shape, November 17, 2023. I am sharing all the links with you. So all the basic reading is with you. And finally, there is a conversation. There is a conversation at CSIS, which is the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies. The conversation is between two scholars, John Alterman, who is a Middle East scholar there, and, C and, and our own C. Raja Mohan. So I will share the transcript with you. You want to listen to the conversation, I suppose you have to go to the website of the CSIS. So these are, these are the four important readings from which we draw our wisdom. Now, if you go back to our president's speech in this parliament session or the opening day of parliament, president spoke in the opening address, she mentioned one thing which then Finance Minister Nirbala Sitaraman repeated, that is the India Middle East Europe corridor, right? India Middle East Europe corridor to which we dedicated a full episode of CTC earlier, I will share a link with you. That is a very important thing for India and that is what, that is what both the President and the Finance Minister mentioned. Finance Minister said that this would define the trade and connectivity in such a large part of the world, at least for the next 100 years. So it is such a defining project. So there is a lot of doubt and skepticism right now that this is not going to happen because of what the Israelis are doing in Gaza or because of what the Hamas people first did to the Israelis to draw this retribution, which has now become like a massive revenge, that if this goes on, how can the Saudi Arabians normalize their relationship with Israel and unless they normalize their relationship with Israel in a way, unless they join the Abraham Accords, which are sometimes called Indo-Abraham Accords also. So unless they join the Abraham Accords, how can IMEEC become possible? It will be a pipe dream. Now, I know that there is skepticism, but the reality on the ground is that Saudi Arabia, while they've been, they've been critical of Israel, they've never said that they are breaking away, they are breaking off from negotiations or for normalization with Israel for good. They have in fact said repeatedly that their normalization will depend on the two-state solution. And this is something that I wrote in a national interest earlier as the fighting after Gaza broke out, that ultimately there will be a two-state solution. So just, at, just as after the Yom Kippur war, five years later, negotiations started and they were the Camp David Accords. Similarly, it is most, it's quite, it's quite possible and, and if you ask me, quite likely, in fact, I'll be surprised if it does not happen in the next five, seven years, there will be a normalization, a two-state solution and the Saudi Arabians and the Israelis will be sitting on the same table and IMEEC will be a reality. Now, IMEEC becoming a reality gives India also many options because India then starts drawing the benefits of its geopolitical location. That is between the East and the West in Asia. So India then becomes the center of Asia. And to that extent, if you read Raja Mohan's article in Foreign Policy, and that is the reason, that is what he means by India rediscovering India, Modi's new India, rediscovering its old role in a changing Middle East, that this is the role that colonial India played, that the colonial play, uh, power in India, colonial, colonial British power in India played sitting in India. So they got their military heft from India, the soldiers, the firepower from India, also the economic power from India. They were the state, they were the government, they were sitting here. So indirectly, India played that role. And with India being that strong, they were able to control both the West and the East of Asia. And the things that Raja lists, they were able to achieve. They were able to win the Boxer War or crush the Boxer Rebellion, which is pre-World War One. World War One, they were able to defeat the Ottoman power in the Middle East, in Turkey and the Middle East. And later in the Second World War, they were able to defeat the Japanese. For all of these, 
India became a springboard. So that is the old role that India has in Asia. Now, India over these years has warmed up to Japan. Japan is a member of Quad, has warmed up to other countries in China's front yard who are all chin pidit. And at the same time, India has opened out to the Gulf Arab states in the Middle East. Usually, because our threats, our threats come from the north, India's threats come from the north and immediate west, that is Pakistan. We look at the north, we look at the east because the, because the Chinese are there or we look at the northeast in terms of our security threats because that's where we have some instability or a chronic history of instability right now. Manipur is the one that's in turmoil. So something or the other is in turmoil. Naga insurgency is still not settled. We don't pay that much attention beyond Pakistan towards our west. However, the British colonial power, when they were in India, never, never, never limited their vision only up to those borders of India, that is up to the Hindu Kush mountains or up to Afghanistan. They looked beyond that. And they, 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 they thereby had close relationships in the Middle East. In fact, they drew the maps of the new Middle East, the post-war Middle East. That is something that Praveen Swami explained to you in one of the episodes of his new, new series, Explorer. I will share a link with you. Please check it out. Also check it out every week because he's doing some marvelous stuff with that new show. It's called The Explorer. So India now, because India is stronger, India has put Pakistan a little bit behind itself in terms of its strategic thinking. India is also playing on a bigger, on a more senior or a higher, on a more senior playing field or in a bigger league. India is able to look at the Middle East differently and that's why alliances like I2U2. I2U2 as you know is India, Israel, UAE, USA. And when you say UAE, it is implicit that Saudi Arabia is somewhere there. And, and that's the reason everybody, everybody is waiting for Saudis and the Israelis to formally establish a relationship. But the fact is that I2U2 has the makings of a, of a quad to the west of India. And this is, this is something which has not been dismantled. You might say that the fighting in Gaza or war in Gaza Maybe a temporary, maybe a setback, but it's only a temporary setback because the larger strategic momentum does not stop. In fact, the important part is how cleverly India has been able to manage this, this opening out to the Gulf Arabs at the same time, keeping a more than working relationship with their biggest rivals, that is Iran. The biggest threat to Gulf Arabs, that is Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc., is not Israel, it's not the Jews, it is fellow Muslims from Iran. That is the reason I say that there is no such thing as the, as the Islamic world. There are many countries with Muslim majority or many countries which call themselves Islamic nations or Islamic republics, but it does not make them one country or one world. That is where India has been able to also maintain very good relations with Iran. In fact, if I go back to what Ashley Tellis is writing, he says that by managing its relationship with Iran quite sharply, quite cleverly and quite, quite, quite soundly, while also opening out to Gulf Arabs who see Iran as their main threat, India has shown, Indian policy has shown flexibility and suppleness or fleet-footedness, which the American policy has never shown. So it's in that situation now that Prime Minister Narendra Modi goes to UAE. This temple gets inaugurated. This temple is a landmark. It's a great thing for Indians living there, particularly Indian Hindus living there. But this is also evidence if evidence is needed that whatever the old cultural or religious restrictions or suspicions or doubts or fears, the, the larger national interest and larger regional interest will always take precedence. And that's the reason we say that while the temple in Ayodhya had profound implications for our national politics, this temple in Abu Dhabi, in the heart of the Islamic world, this new temple also has a deep, far-reaching and great impact on diplomacy and also regional relations as well as, as well as the regional balance of power.